12.01, people had a minute to come in one minute late. <laughs> So I just want to say thank you to everybody who's joining us today. My name is Siri Nelson. I'm the Executive Director at National Whistleblower Center, and you're tuning into our first ever LinkedIn Live with Mark Worth, the Executive Director at Whistleblowing International. Today, we will be talking about how EU countries are failing whistleblowers. So we've been working together, um, NWC and Whistleblowing International, all year trying to educate European legislators and regulators about the value of whistleblower protections. And I'm so happy to have Mark here to tell us more about the efforts that he's made, improvements that need to happen in Europe, and the title, How EU Countries Are Failing Whistleblowers. So I, I really wanna start with Mark, you telling us about yourself and Whistleblowing International and um, giving people a chance to get to know you. Sure, Siri. Well, I'd like to do that, but before I do, I would like to explain through a list of names how European countries are failing whistleblowers in their countries. Antoine Del Tour and Rafael Hallet, Luxembourg, Anna Garrido, Spain, Sreko Sladoyev, Croatia, Valery Atanasov, Malta, Stephanie Jabot, France. Bitten Jensen and Hans Ries in Denmark, an unnamed diplomat whose name we're keeping anonymous in the Czech Republic, and in Germany, Brigitte Heinisch, Daniel Hoffman, and Sasha Lex. Now, these are all names who probably you've never heard. And in Europe, uh, the officials and the public and the media adore the famous whistleblowers who are not from Europe, like Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange. But when it comes to people who live in Europe, who are from Europe, the EU has done very poorly at protecting their own citizens who become witnesses to crime and corruption and public health threats. And we wrote an article recently called Europe Loves Human Rights Unless They Are For Whistleblowers. And we understand that whistleblowing is a difficult issue, but it's something that Europe needs to step up to the plate and take care of. Uh, as Siri mentioned, I am the director of actually several organizations, including Whistleblowing International and the European Center for Whistleblower Rights based here in Berlin, Germany. Uh, I have been working with whistleblowers in various capacities since 1986 as a journalist and then as an activist and now a caseworker operating hotlines giving people legal support, advice, investigating their cases, fighting for them to be reinstated if they've been fired or dismissed, trying to mediate with the retaliators for them to get their jobs back, and of course, pushing for whistleblower laws to be passed, which is why we're talking today. Yeah, and with that said, can you share with the audience your definition of a whistleblower? Well, uh, it, it's a it's a very hazy term. A whistleblower can be seen as anybody who exposes something to the public or to law enforcement or to regulators, secret information, evidence, uh, secret evidence of a crime. But in the context of the new generation of whistleblower protection laws, we're talking about employees, people in a workplace. Uh, and most crime and misconduct does occur in some kind of a workplace, a bank, a, a food agent, a food uh, manufacturer, a hospital, a school. This is where most crime and corruption and public health threats originate. So the new whistleblower laws that are being passed here in Europe and around the world are designed to protect employees from retaliation, from being fired, from being demoted, transferred against their will, mobbed, bullied, ostracized, that sort of thing. But in, in our culture, in our world, and on social media, the word whistleblower can really mean anybody who exposes secret information to the public. And usually it's just a regular citizen who takes upon that role. That's a great definition and very expansive. Whistleblowers could be anyone you never know and you might have to blow the whistle. So one of the things that we've been able to collaborate on is educating people about the highly effective US programs like the Securities and Exchange Commission program, the IRS program, False Claims Act. 
during our International Anti-Corruption Academy course, which just uh, finished. So based on the information that you've encountered in your work in the EU, can you explain what the EU whistleblower directive is and why it's important? Sure. Very briefly, uh, in 2019, in October, the European Union, the, the governmental institutions for the 27 EU member countries passed what's called a directive or a regulation, which requires all 27 EU countries to have strong whistleblower protection rights. This is a very long document, a very complex piece of legislation passed by Brussels. It originated in the European Commission, which is the executive branch of the EU government, was then approved by the European Parliament, which is the legislative branch, and then ultimately approved by the European Council, which is, forms, is formed of delegations from uh, the national governments. Uh, this was a long time coming. I would say Europe has been a little bit behind. Uh, much of the world already, more than 40 countries had passed whistleblower protection laws before the EU got into the game two years ago. Uh, the deadline for the EU countries to pass this new whistleblower law to comply with the EU directive is this Friday on December 17th. And the countries have had two years and two months to do this. Uh, this is not a difficult thing to do. We have tons of research and case law and standards and best practices from organizations like the National Whistleblower Center, the Government Accountability Project, the UN, the EU, the OECD, Council of Europe, uh, from academic institutions. We have now a very set uh, list of provisions and best practices on how to protect employees from retaliation, how they can make reports safely and securely, how to investigate their disclosures and how to hold the guilty parties to account. This is uh, still an evolving science and evolving practice, but we know how to do it now. And as Siri mentioned, the laws in the United States have gotten quite effective in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, sadly, only two countries to our knowledge so far, Denmark and Sweden, have passed a whistleblower law to comply with the new EU directive. Well, I should stop calling it new because it was passed over two years ago. Uh, other countries may have passed a law. We were not aware of that. Most countries have a, a proposed law developed by their justice officials, their justice ministries, and some of them are starting to have hearings in the parliament in their countries. But most countries have taken a very unsafe last minute approach to getting their laws passed, and there's a fear that the laws will be hastily drafted, that they will become cut and paste exercises. In the 10 draft laws that I've seen or 12 draft laws that I've seen, they're very similar in scope and language, which tells me that they're not putting a lot of thought into these new laws, which is very disturbing for many reasons, which we can get into. Uh, the Danish law and the Swedish law, the new laws that were passed before the deadline do not include specific mechanisms for employees to get whistleblower status, to get whistleblower protection, to get the retaliation to stop, and to be compensated for lost wages and other damages. So the first two laws uh, are not good on paper. Every draft law that we have, we have seen is not good on paper. So we are highly concerned that this wonderful framework developed by Brussels, the directive, which includes a lot of provisions that are very progressive and could be used as a very strong tool to fight corruption by empowering regular citizens to report misconduct and protect them from revenge. And many of us think that the directive is stronger than it probably could have been. It's, it has a lot of provisions that are very, very good and progressive. It surprised a lot of us. The lobbying by, uh, or the, the input by the National Whistleblower Center, the labor unions in uh, Europe, groups like Transparency International, our organizations, the Government Accountability Project in Washington, did a wonderful job at putting most, the vast majority of the best practices in this, in this directive. It's not perfect, but it has all the tools that a country would need, minus a couple that could 
serve the basis of a good whistleblower law, but very sadly and surprisingly, the countries are not responding. 25 of them in our survey will miss the deadline. We don't know when they will be passed. The holidays are coming up. Many countries are having elections or just had elections. A lot of countries are in chaos here in Europe and don't have governments formed at the moment. So what that means is that citizens, employees continue to be at risk of being retaliated against. Whistleblower is not an official status in most of these countries in Europe. And I wonder if people listening are surprised by what, what we're saying today. Uh, there are some things we can do to try to fix the situation, uh, but right now it's, it's, it's rather gloomy, but we're still pushing very hard, doing outreach to the parliament members in all the countries. They're responding and saying, yes, we're working on it. We're doing the best we can. Uh, but whether they will take our input to have the laws being very strong on paper remains to be seen. Yeah, I mean, this is why we're here, though, because we're both so enthusiastic about making sure that this issue is taken seriously and understood. So we've worked together to highlight the ways in which whistleblowers around the world can use U.S. programs, can use U.S. programs to report anonymously, can use U.S. programs to seek awards and ask for anti-retaliation protections when they are in companies that are covered by U.S. programs or related to companies that are covered by U.S. programs. And for us, we're looking at the perspective of a global whistleblower who may not have the information about these protections in the United States that can be extended to them as whistleblowers to these federal agencies. And then we wanna see consistency across the globe in terms of whistleblower protections. So when the EU directive came through and actually showed an effort from the EU parliament to create some whistleblower protections and recognize the, right, the contributions of whistleblowers, we were very excited. We wanted to see that become a serious deal and see European whistleblowers protected. People were so excited about it. So when it first happened, when the move was first made, the European directive was adopted. How did you feel? What did you think that was going to mean for people? Well, I remember when I was working at Transparency International in 2013, the European Commission put out a two or three sentence announcement saying you can forget whistleblower protection. It's not on our agenda. It's not going to happen. It was a very blunt message. They wanted no part of it. But then we had LuxLeaks, the big tax evasion scandal in Luxembourg, we had Panama Papers. We had other big scandals revealed by whistleblowers, citizens. It became unavoidable. So when we heard a couple of years later that the commission uh, in our meetings with them in Brussels were starting to look for what's called a legal basis. How could they pass a whistleblower law to comply with the EU legislative structure? We were very surprised and happy. Well, maybe this is going to happen. And then the Green Party and other progressive parties in the parliament formed an anti-corruption working group to push the agenda forward. They started having public conferences, which we attended in around 2016 and 17. A organization called uh, um, uh, Reimagining the Future started up to push the agenda in Brussels to get the uh, signatures on a big petition drive to uh, encourage people to sign on to this. The labor unions got involved, the media started getting involved. So once we heard that the commission was open to this, everybody jumped on board and, and uh, uh, got excited, started working the commission, working the parliament. Uh, we had meetings in Brussels with the, uh, key members of parliament to talk about things like giving employees the freedom to go outside of their company. What sense does it make to report inside of your company when it's the CEO who is either ordering or condoning the corruption? So now a monumental victory was to give people the absolute right to choose whether to report inside their company or organization or call the police, or call the food safety the food safety agency, or call the financial regulator. And why shouldn't you have that right? 
anyway. It's ridiculous to, to, to require an employee to report a crime inside the company where the crime is taking place. It, it, it defies logic. So that was a huge victory. Uh, we expected countries to respond quicker. They, they haven't, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, and we want everybody listening. I imagine we have activists out there listening, lawyers, journalists, citizens. Please contact your member of parliament. Every country has a list on the website of the key members of parliament on the human rights committee or justice committee or employment committee or a committee for the economy or finance. Contact them today and say, please pass a strong whistleblower law that includes protections, that includes compensation, that includes penalties for retaliating against a whistleblower and includes whistleblower rewards. We need to have whistleblower rewards as, as an incentive for people to make a report because there's a very high likelihood that not only will they be dismissed and or fired or demoted, but they could be blacklisted in their industry. They need compensation to get their lives back uh, in shape. And it also serves as a deterrent. If a company knows that one of their employees is gonna receive a financial reward for reporting corruption, that's a big deterrent uh, to stop corruption inside of a company. So uh, please get involved. Please join us and, and help get strong whistleblower laws passed in all EU countries. So can you describe, Mark, um, since the directive was enacted and countries were expected to adopt uh, harmonious laws locally, what have you seen happen? What have you done and what kind of roadblocks have you encountered in these different countries that you've been trying to advocate for better whistleblower protection and better adoption of the whistleblower directive? Well, for more than a year, we've been making phone calls, emails, action alerts that we have distributed to tens of thousands of people all over Europe to write letters and emails uh, to the European or to the parliaments in each country. Brussels has done it, just to clarify to everybody, Brussels has done its job. The EU passed the directive. Their job is finished. Now it's up to each country to pass their own law. So we have tried to engage all the anti-corruption groups in Europe many of them are to uh, uh, do old fashioned activism, calling members of parliament in their countries, sending emails, distributing our action alerts. And we've generated tens of thousands of emails to, uh, to uh, these, these parliament members. We have started to get some responses. People are, the parliaments are thanking us for our input. Uh, they know they have to pass the directive, to pass the law based on the directive. They're, they're promising they will do it. Uh, we are frustrated that they are not taking the advice that we have delivered to them in terms of including all the best practices into their legislation. So far, like I mentioned, Sweden's law is not very good. Denmark's law is not very good, with all due respect to them. And the draft laws we've seen are not, are not good. Behind the scenes, Many, many members of parliament and justice ministry officials have told me that they don't have the expertise, that they don't know how to do this. They're afraid of it. And there's no political will to pass a whistleblower law, which tells me they don't understand this issue. There's a gap between uh, their world and the world of the regular citizen, which tells me that, th that they're out of touch with their own citizens. They don't see that citizens, that regular people, can be partners in fighting corruption. They don't value their own citizens. They're fine with their own citizens being punished for making a report, basically condoning witness tampering and witness intimidation. Whistleblowers are witnesses. Let's get off the word whistle. Let's start talking about people as witnesses, a witness in the workplace who sees a crime, see some documents that don't look quite right. I got a call today from someone who works at a large company who's sending me some documents. This is an employee at a company. She was fired. We're trying to get her job back. She's, she's sending us the documents to investigate. Uh, she lives in a country in Europe, in the EU, which does not have a mechanism for her to be protected and compensated and reinstated. She has to go to court. 
might take three, four, five years, tens of thousands of euros in legal fees and an uncertain outcome. And then the, the likelihood of going back to work at a place that she has sued, engaged in a long legal battle and goes back to work in five years, not very realistic. So this is what we're trying to do is that the trying to convince the lawmakers in the EU countries that they are condoning this kind of witness intimidation, witness tampering, and even something like evidence destruction. Without a strong whistleblower framework, companies and government agencies are free to destroy documents, to destroy evidence, to wipe clean hard drives uh, without a strong investigative mechanism and a strong uh, disclosure channels for, for their employees. So uh, it's important to have strong laws and we, we push for them every day. The advances in the US are a good example of what can be achieved as the next generation of whistleblower laws get passed. But we can't always rely on the law to be there for the person. So we need a strong NGO capacity. We need strong ombudsperson offices in these countries. We need a strong human rights commission in these countries where people can go to confidentially or anonymously to make reports. Because very sadly, even though the public, I would say most of the public views whistleblowers as being heroes, brave people, there's a disconnect between what the general public feels about whistleblowers and about how the official establishment responds when somebody is in need. So it's, uh, uh, it's a very sticky situation. We, we fight every case as, as, as hard as we can. And uh, uh, we, we fight on several fronts. Yeah, yes, that's so important. So on our end in the United States, we encounter some common questions or concerns about the whistleblower protections that we consider to be the best practices model of anti-retaliation, anonymity, and rewards. We see a lot of questions about the value of rewards, the size of rewards, whether or not there needs to be distinct funding for rewards, what types of whistleblowers can be protected. Are whistleblowers that go to the media protected? Are whistleblowers that um, blow, blow the whistle internally protected? Are, and, and how are you facing questions in Europe what are you hearing in Europe? I know that I've personally heard about cultural questions about um, how does this relate to our values in our country, our history? So what kind of discussions have you had around specific issues that um, you think need to be clarified or tackled? Well, those are really good questions, Siri, and, and they're, 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 they're real questions and they serve as real barriers to uh, uh, the, these lawmakers doing the right thing. In Eastern Europe, we have legacies of totalitarian communist and fascist regimes, and also in Southeastern Europe and in some countries in Southern Europe, where informal informants were used by these totalitarian dictatorships to spy on neighbors and, and turn in neighbors, people who were listening to illegal radio programs and listening to illegal records and, and reading newspapers they weren't supposed to read and saying things against the government that they weren't allowed to say. Even here in Germany, you know, I, I live in the former uh, uh, East Berlin. People I talk with here, they don't, they don't understand the concept because what the agency called the Stasi, the uh, public security system, which was in existence in the former Eastern German, uh, East Germany had millions of people spying for the government uh, on citizens to turn in neighbors. People's best friends were, were referring information back to, uh, back to the communist author authoritarian dictatorship here in East Germany. So people here over the age of 40 or 50 or in their 60s and 70s remember this stuff same thing happened during the nazi times same thing happened in uh in the uh in yugoslavia in the eastern the, the soviet bloc countries you had millions and millions of people who were spying 
uh, on their neighbors to get favors from the dictators. If you, if you, if you spy it on someone and turn somebody, maybe you get a car faster. Instead of waiting three years to get a car, you get your car in two years. You get your apartment faster. Your kid would get into a better school. You get a nicer apartment. You get a, a better ration of bananas or coffee. If you could do a small favor for the government and spy on the traitors and the, the people perceived as traitors against the totalitarian regimes. So uh, it, it's, it's, perhaps it's difficult to grasp the, uh, the severity of, of what was going on here for 45 years, but it's real and it's, it's something to deal with. And we have to convince people that, no, no, this is the opposite. That this, these are people who are making reports to promote democracy, to expose the bad guys, to, to go against perhaps even authoritarian tendencies or people promoting authoritarian or dictatorial ideas. But it's very difficult. And there are certain countries that I won't name out of respect where it is just a non-starter. There's a country that's had a whistleblower law in effect uh, for over 15 years in, a, in an EU country. And there is no momentum whatsoever to fully implement the law, to uh, publicly uh, support the whistleblowers. And that's something else we're seeing is that people who work at an anti-corruption agency or an ombudsperson's office that might be in charge of a whistleblower law and a whistleblower system, they themselves view themselves as being a whistleblower because they're defending the rights of a whistleblower. So they feel like they could be retaliated against and they are. So we have to have cultural change inside of the public institutions. Uh, in, in, in Western Europe, and I'm gonna call it Northern Europe, Scandinavian countries and in Western Europe, uh, the opposition is based more on things like privacy. And in France, France has a huge sense of privacy and, 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 and personal data where it's, and here in Germany, it's seen to be very invasive if you report information about somebody else and having a close knit community or a close knit company in countries like Denmark and Netherlands and Scandinavian countries, even the labor models, the work models to talk about working together with the labor unions and management and fixing things internally, which is wonderful. We all wish we could do that, but sometimes that doesn't work if, if a crime has been committed. So there's a lot to overcome. There's a lot to overcome. Uh, we're seeing here in Germany, in the last three years, whistleblowers have led to the uh, exposure of several major corporate scandals, white collar crimes, including a company called Wirecard and Deutsche Bank and Deutsche Bahn, which is the German state uh, train company. Uh, and a couple of people have gone to jail. A couple of white collar criminals have gone to jail because of scandals exposed by whistleblowers. This is new to this country just in the past two years. So we'll see where that goes. The government, we have a new government in Germany, including as a three party uh, coalition, including the Green Party, which historically has been pro whistleblower. In fact, one, one Green Party member of the German parliament or Bundestag was one of the very few people who traveled to the Moscow airport to meet Mr. Snowden after he left the United States. So we're very hopeful in Germany that things will change. You need to have a champion within the parliament to take this thing forward. In every country that has a whistleblower law in Europe and around the world, there's usually one or two people or a political party or a newspaper or a citizen blogger or a whistleblower or an activist, someone who gives a darn, who starts the campaign and then it takes off. So we're hoping to do that here and, and we're very hopeful. Yeah, the stories that you're describing reflect, oh, hold on, I have, okay, reflect how essential whistleblowers are to addressing transnational corruption. You have, you know, different countries having different perspectives, yet you have these multinational companies, you have people who are seeking refuge, you have all these different issues, and that's why it's so important to have consistency in the laws and making sure every whistleblower is protected, no matter where they are. 
We have a we have a comment here from South Africa about the uh, informers. I can't pronounce that word, but South Africa during the apartheid years had a system of, of informers, uh, and the the commenter is saying that this created a has created a perception that's been hostile to whistleblowers. So you see you see what happens uh, where we need to redefine the very idea of, of a citizen getting involved. And this is part of our democratization work that we're doing in Eastern Europe in particular, is to redefine the role of the citizen in their world, not just voting. Voting is great, everybody votes, voting is wonderful, but let's do more than that if, if you so desire. People need to be seen as being active members of their democratic values, defenders of their democratic values in an active way beyond just voting. And uh, this is relatively new. We're talking about countries that have been free for only 30 years, so a generation. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do, but the younger generations in Eastern Europe, in Southern Europe, really get it. And there's a tremendous energy in, uh, in these countries. They have a lot of support from uh, donors, from the European Union, from, from Open Society, from the United Nations, uh, from the Council of Europe and other donors to fund NGOs, to fund independent media, to fund investigative journalism. The United States has funded a lot of investigative journalism through USAID in Eastern Europe, and they are, they are changing the world in Eastern Europe uh, through media, and through blogging and through investigative journalism and leaking websites. Every country in Eastern Europe and Southern Europe has a leaking type organization, a nonprofit newsroom, a nonprofit investigative reporting organization. And there are networks of them. One is called the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network. And the other one is the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. And they work in EU and non-EU countries to expose corruption. All of these countries eventually will be in the EU, Montenegro, uh, um, North Macedonia, Serbia, these will all, Ukraine probably will all be in the EU eventually. They're all vying to get up to the EU standards. They're all trying to match the EU directive on whistleblowing. So it, this is part of a much bigger, and this is why I'm hopeful because the whistleblower directive is not coming out of nowhere. It's coming out of a spirit of democracy citizen engagement, the fact that people are awake to the fact that they can have a better country for their children. A lot of people are leaving Eastern European countries and coming to Germany, Switzerland, Austria to have better opportunities and better education. They want to stay. Believe me, they want to stay in their countries. And uh, uh, as these anti-corruption movements become more effective and make a bigger difference, they will want to stay because their country will be safer and less prone to nepotism and uh, cronyism. Yeah. And so the democracy building aspect is really important. EU is very unique in the way it's organized. It's very different from the United States because it's a group of countries that are collaborating to agree on common norms so that they can further facilitate transnational cooperation. And of course, that should include an anti-corruption effort. It should include allowing citizens to engage in the fight against crime and bear witness to wrongdoing and speak up. And you really bring up the interesting point of this pervasive availability of opportunities to share documentation with the media, to share documentation with sources that promise to keep you safe, but don't have any legal ability or requirement to keep you safe. So actual whistleblower protection laws would enable the same people who want to provide that information just so that they, the public knowledge is, is, is safeguarded so that people know that the truth is out there, right? They want to give the information to the public. They want to give the information to the authorities, but without appropriate whistleblower protections, they can't do that. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think the media needs to do a better job at working with sensitive sources, 
this is also a new concept for countries that are have, have a new have a new uh, new democracies. The idea of the media being free and not politicized is a new concept. We still see that as a problem. Um, whistleblowers often get used for political purposes. Some newspapers will not write about a story from a whistleblower because he or she is from a certain political party and they're exposing something that might be hostile to another political party. So the media has to uh, be more objective, more professional. Um, we hear many stories about the media uh, not protecting the, the anonymity or confidentiality of, the, of their sources. I'm working to try to find out about a situation here in Germany where a very prominent newspaper may have revealed the identity of a whistleblower to the police, which would be an unfathomable uh, violation of so many journalistic standards that uh, it's almost beyond my comprehension. So we're working on that story right now. Uh, the media needs to be less, less exploitative of whistleblower stories and not characterize them as being heroes or martyrs but write about whistleblowing more as an issue, to write about the disclosure and what, what this disclosure has led to. Was the problem fixed? Was somebody prosecuted? Or are we just gonna focus on the whistleblower? Was the person reinstated? Uh, I've tried to get journalists to write stories about people who were reinstated and gotten their job back and gotten some back wages, but that's not interesting enough for them. So about, I'd say about 95% maybe even more, talk about tip of the iceberg, 95% of the news that's happening on this issue is never reported uh, publicly, which is why I'm so happy that, uh, that the organizations that Siri and I work with have started the Whistleblower Network News in Washington, DC, which is a tremendous source of information about whistleblower cases, whistleblower laws, anti-corruption stories, and we encourage everyone watching right now and listening right now to subscribe to Whistleblower Network News and get these stories and then distribute them to retrain the media. Um, it's, very, it's very strange that the media is not doing such a good job at writing about whistleblowers. Very superficial, very sensationalistic, uh, not really digging deeply into uh, the stories as they should. We hope it changes, but that's part of our public work is to, is to get the proper information to the citizens that they understand uh, the full picture of, what's, of, what, of what we're working on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to describe, you know, everything is about communication, just like we're, we're engaging in now. I'd like you to describe some of the things you've um, engaged with around Europe with different your I know you've spoken at conferences as trainings things like that so so can you share a little more about that work well um sure I mean uh uh over the last 10 years we've had we've had many opportunities and I I think that we should give a shout out to the United Nations to the, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the UNODC, which works with the UN Convention Against Corruption, which many people may have heard of. This was the stimulus for passing a whistleblower law in each country. The OECD in Paris has done an amazing job. They have all had, and of course the Council of Europe, Greco, and the European Parliament, uh, and then at the national level, many universities, NGOs have had events. We've, I've spoken at more than 50 conferences uh, over the past 10 years on whistleblower protection, organized many conferences, uh, written many reports, documenting cases and best practices. We wrote the first report ever. I remember I was at a conference in London uh, in 2012 or 13 among whistleblower experts and I was up in the front and I said, okay, raise your hand if you know how many whistleblower laws there are in Europe. And nobody had any idea. Now we all know how many there are. Everybody who works in the field can tell you exactly how many whistleblower laws there are in Europe. But eight years ago, we had, we had so we did the first study on that. We documented the laws and, and what they do and, and the text and everything. So we've come a long way, 
since nobody having any idea, a room full of whistleblower experts not knowing how many whistleblower laws there are uh, eight years ago to now we, we all know. And that's been a large outgrowth of uh, things like the whistleblower, uh, uh, whistleblowing um, research network organized by Professor David Lewis at Middlesex University in London, who has a conference every two years. We have LinkedIn groups, one called Whistleblowing International, and the NGO Protect, which used to be called Public Concern at Work in London has a LinkedIn group. Uh, we have a lot of ways in the Whistleblower Network News. These things did not exist. I think we should recognize how far we've come. We didn't have any, I mean, we had NGOs. We had National Whistleblower Center. We had Government Accountability Project. We had Public Concern at Work in London, a couple of smaller NGOs in Denmark and, and Australia and South Africa. This is all new stuff. We have to look at how far we've come in terms of activism, fundraising, campaigns, casework, holding the bad guys to account. This has all happened in the last 10 or 15 years. So in some way, I feel like we're just getting started, but the development has been huge. Uh, we started the Southeast Europe Coalition on Whistleblower Protection in 2015 in partnership with a great organization in Sarajevo called the Regional Anti-Corruption Initiative, funded by the National Endowment for Democracy in uh, Washington, DC. This was the first regional NGO on whistleblower protection. It's now based in, in Tirana, Albania, at an organization called the Center for the Study of Democracy and Governance. Uh, it includes EU and non-EU countries. 40 NGOs, independent journalists, uh, activists working together to investigate cases, hotlines, uh, fighting for whistleblower laws, monitoring and tracking how the whistleblower laws are working in practice, watching the systems, are people being protected? And we've exposed many examples of the whistleblower systems not working at all in mm -hmm. Romania, in Hungary, in Kosovo, in North Macedonia. I don't want to point, I don't want to single out countries uh, in, um, uh, in uh, Greece and in, in, in many places where that, ha that have laws, they're just not working in, in real life situations. So we started the first regional network. So this would have been unimaginable 15 or 20 years ago. So we've, we've done a lot to build up uh, the capacity for campaigning, Transparency International chapters at the national level do a tremendous job in Ireland and Italy and Greece and North Macedonia and Serbia to fight for whistleblower rights. And I'm leaving some out, I apologize for that. Uh, we hope that some of the larger human rights groups would get on board. I don't wanna name them and shame them, but we know who they are. We think that the international human rights activism community should get involved. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights four times now since 2008 has ruled that whistleblowing is a human right under, under European human rights charters, the fundamental charter of human rights going back to 2008. And I'm, a, I'm disappointed that the mainstream human rights groups have not gotten involved with whistleblower protection. They work on human rights defenders. They work on environmental rights defenders. Well, whistleblowing is is right in their wheelhouse and we hope that they that they do get involved but uh we get a lot of calls from regular citizens asking questions every day phd students professors government officials they call us every day with questions uh i get invited to speak and write book chapters and articles and i was interviewed two days ago by a, a young journalism student in in cologne here in germany this wasn't, this wasn't happening five or eight years ago. So I'm smiling because I'm happy that we have this now. And a lot of this is due to support from groups like the National Whistleblower Center, which stepped up and recognized the need to work on whistleblowing in Europe and has followed through in, in substantive and concrete ways. Uh, we're getting more support, more partnerships with, uh, universities, with NGOs, uh, and uh, 
the directive changed everything, I should say, in, in Europe. And even though the laws are late and are not going to be very good on paper or not as good as they should be, people will start to talk about it more. And I, I know that, that that will lead to more cases. We hope people call us first before they call a newspaper, before they call their own government. People should be careful who they call to make a report. If anybody's listening and is considering making a report, call the National Whistleblower Center or call the European Center for Whistleblower Rights to get advice on how to avoid making a mistake. Because once you post something on Facebook, you can't take it, that, that's it. You're, you're exposed and, uh, and, and you could have a problem. Uh, so that, that's a very good question about everything that we've done, what other groups have done, most newspapers have a secure communication channel, the large newspapers do, for people to send in tips with PGP key and global leaks and, and signal. So that's been another development. And people, people use these things, Tor browser. Regular citizens are becoming uh, very skilled at, uh, at safe and secure communication using these online tools. Yes, and so we're, we're going into the future and you know, simultaneously as the whistleblower frameworks are developing in Europe, we also see that there's a heightened attention to climate controls, there's heightened attention to climate regulations. And in the United States, we submitted a letter to the SEC explaining why it's important that climate whistleblower protections are clear, um, not only for Americans, but also for non-US whistleblowers. And Wendy Addison, and who's on your team, and, and I really work together on that. So I know you've made great progress for climate whistleblowers in Europe as well. And I'd love for you to talk about um, the climate and wildlife whistleblower protections that you've been able to help bring to the um, forefront. Well, we started this campaign in May to have climate included in the new European uh, whistleblower laws. Environment is included. That's kind of a 20th century word. Climate, uh, environment is a 20th century. Climate is a 21st century word. So we have been successful in getting uh, Latvia to include climate whistleblowing as a protective practice in its draft whistleblower law, which we expect to be passed. Many other countries are considering adding climate whistleblowing to their uh, legislation. Uh, we think they all should, for obvious reasons, uh, but it's been difficult to, to get any of the parliaments, frankly, to, to listen and, and pass really strong laws. But we have uh, been working with many of the large uh, climate protection NGOs whose names you would know to distribute our action alerts and come on board with the concept of climate whistleblowing. And of course, National Whistleblower Center has a, its global climate whistleblower center that receives reports on uh, illegal logging, timber, uh, ocean pollution, emissions, violations, endangered species. I mean, you name anything related to, to climate risks or the effects of climate change. Uh, we wrote an article recently in cooperation with the World Wildlife Fund chapter here in Berlin on how they exposed illegal timber from Myanmar being used to refurbish a very famous German Navy training ship, which was just relaunched uh, uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, they've exposed uh, lots of other illegal wood being used in mattress uh, and furniture being sold here in Germany. So, the climate movement could benefit from having legal protections for employees at fossil fuel companies, energy ministries, manufacturing companies, auto builders, uh, uh, that sort of thing, green energy companies. Employees who have information about fraudulent reporting on climate goals or fraudulent emissions reports need legal protections. The directive is vague on whether all climate whistleblowers are protected, I would say that they're not. So we're still pushing. I mean, the good news about most countries being late is that we still have 25 countries which we can push to include climate in their whistleblower protection laws. Somebody's Sorry. making the point here, somebody's yeah. making the point here that uh, even when laws exist, a significant yes. chilling effect yes. remains the norm 
yes. and substantially inhibits reporting. Mm -hmm. I think it, I think that that the the fact that most laws are very technical and require channels and deadlines and procedures can be intimidating for a citizen. That's why they should call us uh, instead of. I mean, I think it's good to people to educate themselves and read their whistleblower laws. Definitely read a whistleblower law if you want to be a whistleblower, but they're not always clearly written. They're very technical. Some of them have contradictory provisions. Uh, I'm not sure that's what the person was referring to, but obviously- but I, I want to go are... even deeper onto the question yeah. because the, the, the heart of it to me is that even when you have laws, the question is, what is their impact? And we were talking, you mentioned that the laws that are going to be adopted, you anticipate they're not going to be very good. We already have laws that are adopted that are not very good. So what we see is that EU countries are failing whistleblowers because they're failing to institute adequate laws that involve the kinds of protections that we're talking about, the anti-retaliation, the confidentiality, the awards, the danger, like the damages that you would need if you blew the whistle. And instead, there's a lot of avenues to unsafely disclose information where other interests are coming into play. And this is having a transnational effect. So what do you see happening in real life, in real life, pragmatic sense? What do you see happening going forward as these laws are being enacted? And what do you think in top three things that you would say need to happen to provide adequate protections for whistleblowers in the EU? Well, to answer your first question, I think that the directive and the laws being passed will be a catalyst to introduce the issue to the general public. Uh, and that, that's already happening. In fact, I've gotten calls from people saying, oh, I read about the directive, am I protected? Of course, they're not because of the directive, but they, they're, they're becoming aware of it. So it is becoming a catalyst for the public and for NGOs and anti-corruption groups. The three things that has to happen that have to happen would be one, more support for whistleblower NGOs so we can help people directly. Number two is training for the public institutions, the government agencies that will be in charge of the whistleblower protection system. And this is gonna be an ombudsman's office, uh, an anti-corruption commission, perhaps a human rights commission or a civil rights commission or an anti-discrimination office, whatever the designated public agency is that receives the retaliation complaints and provides the protection and the reinstatement of the employees, they have to know, they have to have the highest level of knowledge and experience in knowing how to identify retaliation and getting the person back to work or best or even better protected from retaliation in the first place. And the third thing I would just say would be courage among the people who are afraid of this issue still, who are not with it in terms of the new generation of thinking about the role of the citizen. Uh, I'm not sure how much we can help with that, but we certainly can help by telling stories about how where whistleblowing has worked. And I devote a lot of my time writing articles for whistleblower network news and for LinkedIn about people who have been reinstated or people who made the right decision not to blow the whistle because of the risks to them or a successful campaign of an activist. So we can, we can, we can nurture courage by talking about how it works, which gets back to the media problem. If the media would stop being so sensationalistic and superficial and start writing about the impacts, the positive impacts uh, that would really help. So uh, whistleblower, I would say NGO capacity, training of the public officials and courage. And those, these things all fit together because they're all about us. I mean, all, all we hear about nowadays is, is, I mean, everybody wants a better world all the time, but what's been happening lately to everybody, to families and people all over the world, I think now more than ever, people want to have a better world. And how are we going to come out of this big mess that, that was caused? Uh, that was caused. Uh, and I think that giving people hope that their, that their voice matters is a very important and meaningful way to nurture courage 
is by people being acknowledged for what they're doing. And uh, the other day I, I was on a tram here in Berlin with my kids and a man on the tram uh, was uh, harassing some women and physically abusing them. And we all called the police and the man was arrested. And uh, later that day, I was, I was stopped on the street by someone saying, oh, weren't you the guy on the tram who, 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 who stopped that guy from, uh, from beating up those women? I said, yeah, I, I helped, yeah. And the guy thanked me for doing that. So, you know, being a witness is a good thing. And not everybody, uh, it's not for everybody. We don't encourage whistleblowing. But if people want to do it, we can help people do it safely uh, and to make the most impact. Yes, thank you so much. Um, well, we're coming to the end of our time here. You know, you sharing so much of your knowledge during this LinkedIn Live conversation has just been so impressive and magical. We've had some fantastic participants and great comments from the chat. It's been wonderful. Um, we certainly want to keep in touch. So. Mark, can you can you tell people how they can keep in touch with you? Sure. Uh, but first, I want to acknowledge uh, somebody wrote in from the UNODC. I want to thank the UNODC, the UN Office of Drugs and Crime in, in Vienna, for being a leader on whistleblower protection, very quietly, very below the radar. But through the UN Convention Against Corruption, which is the main anti-corruption treaty signed by most countries in the world, which includes whistleblower protection, this has been one of the main uh, 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 tools to convince countries to pass a whistleblower law to comply with the convention. Uh, if anyone, so go to LinkedIn, type in Mark Worth, you will see my uh, profile and links to all of our organizations, the European Center for Whistleblower Rights, which is whistleblower-rights.org, whistleblower-rights.org. And Whistleblowing International is wbwhistleblowing.org. Uh, my email addresses are on LinkedIn. My personal mobile phone number is on LinkedIn, which has WhatsApp and Signal. If you are considering blowing the whistle or making a report or have questions, I'm very easily reachable through LinkedIn uh, and also on Facebook. But LinkedIn has all my information and please call and ask a question or if you want to work together in any country in the world to start a whistleblower campaign, work on a case, anything that's needed, please contact me today. Thank you, Mark. And you can always visit whistleblowers.org. That's www.whistleblowers.org to find out more about National Whistleblower Center. And you can find us on Twitter at Stop Fraud and Instagram at Protect Whistleblowers. So we are so open to people being in touch. We have a mailing list you can subscribe to. Sometimes Mark writes for us, even on our mailing list. And we have an intake form that you can fill out um, if you believe that you know about wrongdoing that you wanna report. The intake form will bring you into a confidential network of possible attorneys that could represent you. If you want representation, please fill out the intake form. If you email us, we cannot provide you with any attachment, any references to counsel or anything like that. So you're going to want to use the get help button on our website if you want help. Um, you can look out for more LinkedIn lives. We're so grateful that you're here with us today. And um, I am just, I'm just overwhelmed with gratitude for everybody's participation and can't wait to see you all at our Twitter space on Thursday, where we'll be talking with Tom Devine of the Government Accountability Project about anti-retaliation and why Elon Musk's anti-whistleblower rhetoric is a huge red flag. See you all. Bye, Siri. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining. Bye.